Dear all, welcome back to one of our NephroTube Nephrology Lectures. In this lecture, I will talk about uh, thrombotic microangiopathy in adults and acute kidney injury. I want to cover uh, five, four important questions, starting by what is meant by thrombotic microangiopathy, what are the causes of TMA, what is the mechanism of TMA in cases of TTPHS, how to diagnose and how to treat uh, TMA. Let's start by the first question is meant by thrombotic microangiopathy. Thrombotic microangiopathy means that there is an intraluminal platelet thrombosis, a thrombus due to platelet accumulation. This platelet accumulation will lead to consumption of platelets, which will induce, induce thrombocytopenia. Also, while the RBCs are trying to pass through this uh, narrow uh, vessels due to the presence of the thrombi, the RBCs will be fragmented and hemolyzed, causing microangiopathic hemolytic anemia presented by uh, always present by uh, anemia, high LDH and bilirubin level. So, that is what meant by uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. And the second question that we want to answer is are the causes of thrombotic microangiopathy in general. We'll enumerate the causes now, just enumeration, and later in this lecture, I will present you a diagnostic approach how to differentiate between them. The most two important causes of thrombotic microangiopathy are the TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, and the HUS, hemolytic hermic syndrome. There is a, a large list of causes or etiologies that may cause also thrombotic microangiopathy that I will differentiate them later from TTBHS according to the diagnostic approach that I will present. Regarding the third question, what is the mechanism of thrombotic microangiopathy in TTB and HUS? And I will now concentrate in the pathogenesis only on the TTB and HUS. Let's start by to uh, explain how or what is the mechanism for the formation of intraluminal platelet thrombosis in the different uh, these case uh, situations. I will discuss how intraluminal platelet thrombosis occurs in TTP and in, in HUS. Uh, actually, we have two types of HUS, hemolytic hermic syndrome. The Shiga toxin HUS, which is called typical hemolytic hermic syndrome. I will talk about it in details now. And the second type is a complete mediated TMA, or what, which is called a typical HUS. Let's start by thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, TTP, and let's explain uh, how platelet thromboses uh, occurs in these uh, situations. As we know normally, the platelets in the blood may be activated and accumulated in the presence of large multimer of von Willebrand factor. So if there is overactivation of von Willebrand factor, the platelets will be collected, aggregated, and causing platelet thrombosis. But we have in our body what is called Adamtis 13, which divide the von Willebrand factor into small fragments, preventing the overactivation of the platelets and preventing the platelet thrombosis. So if the Adamtis 13 is not working well, there will be overactivation of von Willebrand factor with overactivation of platelets and formation of platelet thrombi. So in absence of ADAM T13 or in the presence of antibodies against ADAM T13, we will have platelet microthrombi. So if it is absent, we will have this problem or if it is present, but we have autoantibodies against it, we will have the same problem. So according to this, two types of TTP, the autoantibodies TTP Autoantibodies against ADAMT13. This will this is called acquired TTP, and this present uh, and this presence in about 60% to 90% of the cases. And if it is deficient, it is called inherited or congenital TTP, where the ADAMT13 is absent or deficient in amount. Let's summarize. Autoantibodies, the acquired TTP. In this case, what is the pathogenesis? This long thread is the von Willebrand factor, 
actually it must be divided by the adnantes uh, 13 into small molecules but in the presence of antibodies against adnantes 13 its activity will be decreased so the von Weldbrand will be collected in ultra large multimers causing activation of platelets and causing microthrombi but in cases of inherited deficiency of adnantes 13 congenital ttp this congenital deficiency of adnantes 13 and there is more than 150 mutations identified till now decrease the adam ts13 will cause large ultra large von Willen factor multimers with activation of platelets and micro thrombi uh, it is important to mention that in hereditary thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura the disease may not be presented uh, uh, until uh, adult age and until the presence of precipitating factors that will precipitate the activation of both development factor as pregnancy, infection, inflammation, and trauma. So in short, TTP pathogenesis is mainly dependent on ADAMT13. Whatever, it is because autoantibodies against ADAMT13 or because of deficiency of ADAMT13. Now let's talk about the first type of hemolytic hemic syndrome. HUS, which is the typical HUS or what is called Shigatoxin HUS. In this case, the patient is infected by Shigatoxin producing E. coli, which is called stick, or by Shigella dysentery. Mostly, the serotype of uh, Shirishia coli is the O157H7 uh, uh, serotype, and there are other serotypes that may cause the same presentation. Once the patient is infected, the toxins are released in the intestinal human, causing watery diarrhea for about one to two days, followed by bloody diarrhea. Then the toxin is absorbed on the endothelial cells of the blood vessels. There is GB3 receptor. The toxins bind to this receptor, endocytosed into the endocytes, causing apoptosis and destruction of the endothelium with activation of microthrombi formation. Also, the toxins are transferred and transported by blood cells, reach the kidney. And also on the kidney endothelial cell, there is GB3 receptor that the toxins will bind to it, causing also activation of inflammation and thrombosis within the kidney, causing HUS. So in summary, the Shiga toxin associated with HUS, HUS is due to the absorption of the Shiga toxin that binds to the endothelium, causing the damage of the endothelium and thrombosis. But it, is it was discovered that also in these cases, there is a complement activation by alternative pathway. It's not only the Shiga toxin, although the Shiga toxin is the main pathogenesis, but in these cases, there is also in children, there is also uh, activation of the alternative pathway. You have to put in mind that there are other infections that may be associated with thrombotic microangiopathy in general. This is the list of the infections. Actually, each infection of them uh, will present with a clue in the case that will get your mind to. Uh, try to diagnose the uh, causing infection. So, so you have to put in mind that there are other infections that, that may present with TMA. So in summary, the Shiga toxin HUS is generally due to toxin binds in endothelium, toxins, uh, toxin binds in endothelium, but don't forget that also there is activation of the alternative pathway. Regarding the second type of HUS, which is the typical, the typical, <coughs> sorry, a typical HUS, which is also called complement mediated team A. In these cases, there is evidence of overactivation of the alternative pathway in these patients. These patients have low serum C3 levels and normal C4. So there is overactivation of alternative pathway. Uh, the causes of uh, overactivation of alternative pathway may be one of three. Let's start by the first two. There may be a genetic deficiency in complement regulators of the uh, alternative pathway or there is hyperactivity or gain of function in complement activators this is the complement pathway as you know there may be overactivation as we said a genetic overactivation of the complement pathway itself or as you know there are regulators of the complement pathway inhibitors that regulate the complement alternative pathway preventing its overactivation there may be a genetic deficiency in these factors causing overactivation of the alternative pathway. There's a long, large list of uh, genetic mutation, mutations in complement alternative pathway. 
What is the importance of knowing this uh, genetic mutations for the diagnosis and also these are important uh, if you are going to make kidney transplantation for the patient. In this uh, lecture I'm, I will not talk about kidney transplantation and for patients with TMA but in general there are some genetic mutations uh, that the recurrence of the disease is very common in the graft and uh, some of them or little of them the recurrence is very low. One of the most important point what if you if, what if you are suspecting uh, that that your that your case is a typical HUS and you did the genetic, but you didn't detect any mutation? The absence of mutation doesn't preclude genetic form because not all the genetic variants are known till now. This one important point. The second important point, the second important point is, is that the uh, the penetrance of uh, familial. Uh, a typical HUS is incomplete, so it may be presented with advanced advanced age, especially in the presence of a uh, triggering factor or a hit that will unmask this overt atypical HUS. But usually the presentation is uh, below the uh, age of 60 years. So back to the causes of atypical HUS, we told that there may be genetic deficiency in complement regulators or gain of function of complement activators also there may be acquired acquired autoantibodies against uh, regulators and this is present in about of five to ten percent of the atypical hs cases you may find inhibitory antibodies so to collect in summary the mechanism of complement mediated hs there may be genetic deficiency of complement regulators gain of function of complement activators or acquired antibodies, say, uh, against factor H or any of these factors. This will activate <coughs> alternative pathway, especially in the presence of a presupposing factor as uh, infection, pregnancy, or surgery. Activation of the alternative pathway will cause or will uh, form the membrane attacking complex that will damage the endothelium, causing activation of von Willebrand factor and other factors with, which will initiate formation of microthrombi. So in summary, the complement mediated TMA is due to abnormality in the, in the alternative complement. So now we uh, know well how <coughs> intraluminal bed thrombosis uh, occurs. Again, let's talk again about what is meant by macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia. As we said, there is obstruction by the microthrombi causing a mechanical fragmentation of RBCs, destruction of RBCs giving a fragmented of uh, fragmented RBCs which is called schistocytes with high level of LDH, bilirubin and anemia. So now we answered the first three questions. Let's talk now about the clinical point of view. What is the diagnostic approach of TTP, HUS and TME? How I diagnose them? If you are in front of a case with evidence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, how do I diagnose the cause? The evidence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is by the presence of anemia, thrombocytopenia, high reticulocytic count, high LDH, and bilirubin levels. The most important point because before I, I, I am going through the approach of how to diagnose cases of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, that these systemic findings of TMA may not be present because we have in nephrology a category called the renal limited TMA, thrombotic microangiopathy that only present within the kidney without this, uh, these systemic manifestations. And usually it is caused by uh, another etiology of renal impairment as glomerulonephritis. nephritis. So find glomerulonephritis nephritis with renal limited TMA, antibody mediated rejection with uh, renal limited TMA, drug induced. TMA may be localized within the kidney, and this will be diagnosed only by pathology. So, what if I have systemic manifestations of TMA, anemia, thrombocytopenia, high reticulocytic LDH, and bilirubin levels? What I have to put in mind? I have to put in mind that the cause may be HUS, one of the long list that I mentioned. We go now in stepwise approach, steps, five steps, but by the way, you have to go through the five steps at the same time, at the same time. But we, when you think in your mind for diagnosis, you have to go step by step. But 
you have to order all these investigations and make all these assessments in parallel. Step one, you have to exclude drugs as quinine, semvastatin, interferon, and calcineurin inhibitors. Another long list of drug, drugs that may cause TMA. I will concentrate on contraceptives. Uh, they may cause TMA, and it was suggested by British uh, guidelines for TMA in 2012 that women with previous TTP should be offered non estrogen containing contraception. Okay. Then, after exclusion of drugs, drugs, the second step is to exclude autoimmune hemolysis. You have to do COMS test. With COMS test, if it is positive, so it is not TTP or T, uh, it, it is not TM8, it is autoimmune hemolysis event syndrome. If it is negative, with the presence of schistocytes on the blood film, so it is TMA and we have to proceed. So now, as you see, that TMA is a diagnosis of exclusion. I am trying to exclude other causes that uh, present with uh, the same shape of TMA uh, to uh, diagnose the causes at the end. One of the important points that the presence of schistocytes in the blood film is not mandatory for the diagnosis of TMA because the uh, lab may not detect it or uh, the, uh, the blood film uh, done late after the diagnosis of the case. So schistocytes may not be present and may not be available for diagnosis. So if there is negative uh, Coombs test and there is schistocytes on blood film, or in the absence of schistocytes but with a high suspicion of TMA, you have to find other causes of TMA. Again, we are trying to exclude all other causes before we diagnose the case as TTP or HUS. To do in step three coagulation profile, PT, PTT, INR. If the coagulation profile is abnormal, so it is not TTP, HUS. It may be DIC or herpes syndrome. You have, ha you, make, you have to make FD products, fibrin degradation products. If it is high, so it is usually DIC. If it is normal, so it may be herpes syndrome. And in herpes syndrome, uh, you will find the liver enzymes high. They may be triple than normal. If they are normal, so it is TTBHS or other causes of Team A. Again, I have to exclude other causes of Team A before diagnosing the case as TTBHS. <coughs> what are the other causes? <coughs> First, malignant hypertension. Malignant hypertension, especially if the stall is more than 200 and the stall more than 130, may cause uh, TMA like picture. You have to put in mind that TTB unlikely to present with severe hypertension, and uh, in this case, the management will be by managing hypertension, and I will talk about the management later on. Preeclampsia if the patient is pregnant and there is no elevation of blood pressure and proteinuria after uh, week 20. So this may be preeclampsia and put in mind again that TTP generally not have raised blood pressure. The case may be because of sepsis. You will find the patient hypotensive, feverish and blood culture will be positive. You have to exclude pregnancy in all cases presented with, uh, present with uh, <coughs> Uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia uh, in child uh, in women with the child bearing age. We have to exclude autoimmune disease because all these diseases comes all these diseases come with secondary uh, team A. And finally, you have to exclude copalamine deficiency because there is an evidence that vitamin B12 deficiency may cause a presentation like team A. To put in mind again the infections that may cause. Uh, team A, don't forget them. Malignancy may cause team A, so if there is high suspicion of malignancy, you have to search for, especially if the patient is losing weight or have alarming signs and symptoms of malignancy, so we have to exclude malignancy. And finally, I want to talk about two uh, causes uh, that are considered as case reports. Acute pancreatitis may cause thrombotic microangiopathy, and in this case, you will find a high level of amylase. And by the way, Acute pancreatitis may cause thrombotic microangiopathy, and thrombotic microangiopathy may cause acute pancreatitis. Also, there are some reports that, ca that cases with hyperthyroidism, uh, thyrotic causes may be represented by Team A, so you have to uh, evaluate the thyroid function. So after exclusion of all other causes, now you are in front of three final causes. DTP, 
a typical HUS and Shigatoxin HUS. If the case is Shigatoxin HUS, it is usually in children, although it may be present in, uh, in any age. The patient presents with watery diarrhea for about one to two days, followed by bloody diarrhea. You have to do stool culture and to do PCR or ELISA for Chiga toxin in stool. Okay, if this is not Chiga toxin HUS, so the case is TTP or atypical HUS. Uh, actually, atypical HUS is the last diagnosis, it is the last diagnosis of exclusion. So now we have to exclude TTP at first. How to exclude TTP? You have to do Adam T13 activity. If it is low, less than 10%, so it is TTP. Okay, we have two types of TTP. TTP due to deficiency of Adam T13 or TTP due to autoantibodies. In both, in both cases, the Adam T13 is less than 10%. But how to differentiate between both cases? By detecting autoantibodies against Adam 13 in the serum. If there is autoantibodies against Adam 13, so it is uh, immune mediated TTP. If not, so it is congenital inherited TTP. By the way, there is a score called the plasmic score for the estimation of likelihood of Adam 13 deficiency. This score present as calculators, <coughs> as a calculator that you uh, enter the data and uh, it gives you uh, a risk stratification according to the, the total score but it is not uh, mandatory to diagnose and actually you uh, are not in need to do it to start a treatment because i will say later the treatment is important to start as early as possible even in the absence of uh, other lab investigations that i'll mention later finally we can say the case is a typical hus if there there is absence of infection or uh, evidence of typical HUS, absence of deficiency or autoantibodies of ADAMT13, and absence of other systemic associated disease. So, a typical HUS is the last diagnosis of exclusion. One important point regarding this uh, diagnostic approach is <coughs> it is recognized that in clinical practice, the full spectrum of these tests is often not often readily available. It may take days to months especially the Adam T13 and the genetic uh, mutation testing of HUS. So you have to start the treatment once the clinical and the laboratory available laboratory data are diagnosis TTP. So you have to start immediately plasma exchange as I mentioned plasma exchange is the first line of treatment in most of the cases not all of the cases but in most of the cases and you have to start the treatment immediately. I want to mention one point it is, it is always mentioned in books and texts that TTP uh, predominantly present with neurological manifestations with minimal presentation of EKI. I want to say that is not the case in uh, most of our clinical practice. And they say that HS mainly present with EKI and uh, minimally to present with neurological involvement also, this may not be the case. In most texts that <coughs> they present that TTP must present with a pentad Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, acute renal insufficiency, neurological abnormality, and fever. From clinical practice, not all cases present with this pentad. It is rare to find this pentad, so you have to remove it from your mind. To summarize the systematic approach <coughs> of diagnosis, first you have to exclude uh, drugs, then you have to exclude uh, autoimmune hemolysis. <coughs> <coughs> by doing PTPTTINR, sorry, the autoimmune hemolysis by doing comp cyst, a coagulation profile, exclude other systemic disease, and finally try to diagnose it is TTP or HUS by the level of ADAMT13 and its activity, and its uh, by its activity, sorry, and autoantibodies. Also, this systemic approach is summarized in this slide. As you see, first you diagnose that there is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and exclude autoimmune hemolytic anemia, exclude TTB by adaptive activity and autoantibodies, exclude other infections, exclude secondary causes as we said, and finally make the genetic test if it is a typical hemolytic uremic syndrome to diagnose the genetic abnormality. Now after we <coughs> mentioned and talked about the diagnostic approach of TTP-HUS, now we have to talk about the treatment protocols.
you remember this slide uh, that I used in the uh, illustration of the pathogenesis of TMA? I will start now by the management of Shiga toxin HUS, typical HUS. We mentioned the main etiology is infection by uh, stack or Shiga dysentery uh, and the presence of toxins in the lumen that are absorbed causing the disease. So the treatment in this case generally supportive, including dialysis if required, no role for anticoagulation, no role for anti-motility drugs because we need the diarrhea to go on to uh, loss the bacteria from the GIT because the presence the presence of bacteria for a long time with anti-motility drugs in the intestine will cause secretion of more toxins and more absorption of toxins. Also no role for antibiotics because antibiotics will cause lysis of the bacteria releasing its toxins uh, with more absorption of toxins and more severe and more exacerbation of the case. But antibiotics may be used if the patient presenting with uh, bacteremia. <coughs> it also may be used <coughs> in Shiga uh, dysentery type 1 and it was used in the German epidemic uh, they used azithromycin uh, this was uh, an epidemic uh, many years ago that uh, was present in Germany the question is there any role for plasma exchange in atypical HUS actually no no role for a typical uh, no role for plasma exchange. However, there are some reports that a plasma exchange may be used in gigatoxin associated HUS in severe cases with severe organ damage. So now we mentioned the treatment of gigatoxin HUS. Let's talk about complement mediated TMA or complement mediated HUS atypical HUS. We said that there is a mutation or antibodies for the complement alternative complement pathway so the treatment is one of two the first is to use eclizumab or uh, ravizumab to block c5 anti c5 to prevent the formation of membrane attacking complex second is to make plasma exchange we, we mentioned that about five to ten percent of these cases have antibodies or antibodies against the regulators so you may make you may make plasma exchange or use immunosuppressive in these cases to eliminate the autoantibus. So let's talk more about the role of plasma exchange in complement mediated hemolytic uremic syndrome. What are the benefits of plasma exchange in this case? First of all, plasma exchange allows supplying a larger amount of plasma without volume overload or fluid overload. Plasma exchange will remove the mutant uh, regulators, not only the CFH, only uh, any uh, regulator, one of the regulators that is mutant, and supply the patient with new normal uh, regulator. Also, plasma exchange can remove uh, antibodies against the regulators, not only uh, uh, CFH, but also factor H and other factors. And plasma exchange is mandatory in cases with life threatening organ and organ damage. If there is an evidence of autoantibodies, as we said, you can use immunosuppressants as rituximab or sarcosamide to clear circulating antibody and prevent relapse. We now talked about the management of two the two types of HUS. Let's summarize, let's summarize them. In the gigatoxin induced HUS, we said that the treatment is generally supportive. No role for anticoagulation, no role for anti-motility drugs, no role for antibodies except in some situations, and the plasma exchange. There are case reports about plasma exchange in these cases, especially if there is, uh, or in cases with uh, severe target organ damage. Typical HES, the treatment is anti, anti C5, eclizumab, ravilizumab. Plasma therapy is better with plasma exchange than plasma infusion plus immunosuppressive therapy if there is evidence of auto antibody. Now, after we talked about the treatment of the two types of HUS, let's talk about the treatment of TTP. Mention that we have two types of TTP. TTP due to autoantibodies against ADAMT13 or due to inherited deficiency of it. 
let's talk about auto antibodies against TTP, acquired TTP, uh, auto antibodies against ADAMT13. In these cases, we mentioned that the ADAMT13 activity is less than 10%, and the antibodies to ADAMT13 auto antibodies are present. There is evidence that the auto antibodies may not be detected in the serum due to multiple factors, but if the case is highly suspicious for this disease, you have to treat. Again, that was a summary for the <coughs> of the pathophysiology and pathogenesis of immune mediated TTB that we mentioned. We mentioned that there is auto antibodies against uh, Adam T13 that will distract the uh, that will that will not affect the von Weber factor and it will present in large multiple. So so the treatment first plasma exchange. Plasma exchange will eliminate the antibody and replace the deficient Adam T13 so that Adam T13 can distract von Weber factor into small uh, multimers. We get the patient corticosteroids which sub will suppress antibody production. Can give the patient rituximab to inhibit B cell lymphocyte to produce antibody. We can give the patient Caba uh, Cablacizumab, which will inhibit the von Weber factor to interact with platelets. But actually, regarding the uh, actually regarding the uh, Cablacizumab, it doesn't, however, affect the antibody formation. It just work on the last step, so it can't be used alone. Actually, as we will show you now, all of these lines can be used at the same time. Again, not all these drugs may be available at your country, but if they are all available in your country, you can use this approach. You have to start with daily plasma exchange plus steroids. And regarding steroids, uh, how I ha how I have to give steroids, or steroids or pulse steroids. Also, the evidence here is not clear. Some uh, later uh, uh, references mention that they give oral steroids one milligram per kilogram per day. Some mention that they give pulse steroids. Some classify the TB according to severity. If it is severe, uh, we will give uh, pulse steroids for three days, then oral, then oral steroids, and so on. Then, uh, cabalicizumab, if it is not available, you can use rituximab. There may be a response of refractory case, or the patient may be refractory. Let's mention what is meant by refractory case. Refractory disease mean, means lack of clinical response, and in some other references, uh, uh, lack of response means the patient still have still has symptoms and uh, thrombocytopenia, although of seven days of plasma exchange. Also, what is meant by relapse, recurrence of thrombocytopenia following remission, and the patient again has ADAMT13 activity less than 10%. Okay, if there is a response, and the patient in clinical remission just follow up, and this is usually done by the hematologist. If there is exacerbation of refractory disease, you have to increase volume of frequency of plasma exchange and add cabalicizumab or uh, and or rituximab. I will talk about plasma exchange in details now. Okay. And there are off-label drugs at the end that you can use in a refractory case. Also, there are some drugs evidence that you can use, especially if you don't have cabalicizumab or rituximab in your uh, institution. There are some uh, literature talk about cyclophosamide, portizumib, cyclosporin, mycophenolatemapetil, and yes, the last line is splenectomy, but this will be the indicate, uh, indica this will be uh, decided by many the hematologists. All the literature talked, uh, talked about vancrestin, all of these are case reports about other drugs that, that can be used. Okay. What about plasma exchange? Actually, plasma exchange is the first line of management. Even, even if you have the rituximab and the cabalicizumab in your uh, institute, or if you don't have them, so the first line is always plasma exchange. Let's talk. What if you don't have uh, rituximab and the cabalicizumab in your uh, country or institution, you will start by plasma exchange and steroids. Plasma exchange must be started within four to eight hours of diagnosis because with the delay of the treatment, more thrombosis will be formed within the body of the patient, cause more complications, as say for say visual loss. I have to uh, initiate plasma exchange. Multiple uh, references with multiple uh, techniques. Uh, 
Here in the British guidelines, they're supposed to start by 1.5 plasma volume exchange, and when the case is stable, uh, reduce it to one plasma volume. In other uh, parts, uh, as the Canadian aphoresis trial said that to start 1.5 plasma volume for three days, followed one by followed by one plasma volume exchange thereafter, whatever you have to start by plasma exchange. So it is five plasma exchange. If the patient is refractory, which is diagnosed by clinical symptoms persistent or a persistent thrombocytopenia in spite of seven daily plasma exchange, you have to intensify if there is neuro new neurological insult or new cardiac insult. And by the way, <clears throat> if your institution have rituximab, but your use for it is limited, but you can use it, you can use rituximab in cases of TTP if there is one of these indications too. So we can say these indications are for intensification of plasma exchange and the use of rituximab if you didn't use it from the start. You have to use rituximab if there is refracted TTP, if there is neuroneurological insult or new cardiac insult, or if the patient is presented from was presented from the start by new neurological or new cardiac insult from the beginning. You can start by rituximab if it is available at your institution, but you are selecting but you are using it in selected cases. But what is meant by intensify plasma exchange? This is means this uh, means to increase frequency or volume. Volume, for example, if you are doing one plasma exchange volume, you will do 1.5. Frequency, say you are making 1.5 plasma exchange volume, and don't and you don't want to increase the volume, you can increase the frequency for uh, for example to make plasma exchange twice daily for the patient. Where to stop plasma exchange? <coughs> You have to pro, uh, stop plasma exchange. You will do the following. You will do daily plasma exchange, and you should continue it for a minimum of two days after platelet count has been more than 1,500. One so we do plasma exchange for two consecutive days with platelet count, normal platelet count, then you stop it. And by the way, there are other parameters that some literatures use to indicate when to stop plasma exchange rather than I said some old references depend uh, depend on uh, the level of the edge and some depend on what is called the plate plateau but I think this is the most practical and the easiest one Let's say that you are in a place and this is very common in many parts of the world it, <coughs> let's say that you are an institution that the plasma exchange is not available First, you have to arrange to transfer your patient to place where there is plasma exchange because the main treatment and the only treatment that you have to start with is the plasma exchange. See, so what you will you will do till you refer your case. You can start by plasma infusion till you refer the case. You have to give the patient 25 to 30 milli, milli per kilogram per day of plasma. If there is delay in arranging plasma exchange <coughs> or if you will transfer your patient to another area. <coughs> other adjuvant therapies that you use to treat to treat TTP, uh, whatever you will start, you have rituximab or not, cabezuzumab or not, this adjuvant treatment you will do in all patients. Antiplatelets, but this will be used only if the platelet count is more than uh, 50,000 folic acid because there is hemolysis, blood transfusion according to the clinical situation, platelet transfusion if there is severe bleeding or the patient will require an invasive procedure, and thromboprophylaxis also uh, if the platelet count is more than 50,000. Now we talked about the management of acquired TTP, what about congenital TTP. You mentioned congenital TTP, the ADAMT 13 activity is less than. 10%, but uh, there is no autoantibodies against it. The main idea here in the treatment depends on replacement of ADAMT13. The patient has a deficiency in ADAMT13, so we have to replace it. Actually, it's a half life is about three to eight days. So, how we can replace it? By doing plasma infusion. <coughs> For how long the patient needs a plasma transfusion? For all for all his life, the answer is no. You will use plasma infusion only in treatment of acute episodes, and 
you will use it in case, uh, by, as a prophylaxis in those with recurrent uh, symptoms. You may need to make plasma transfusion or plasma infusion weekly for this patient or every two weeks. Also, you may make plasma exchange, especially in patients with severe target organ damage and patients with precipitating factors as pregnancy, infection, inflammation, and trauma. To replace large amount, this plasma exchange will give you uh, the chance to replace large amount of plasma without uh, volume overload for the patient. And the there is now recombinant ADAMT13 is country, uh, currently ongoing phase 3 trial for treatment of these patients with hereditary thrombotic thrombocytopenic purple. Finally, I will talk about, in short, just the enumeration treatment of other forms of TMA. <clears throat> As HELP syndrome, in HELP syndrome, you have to give supportive care and use induced delivery. Drug induced, we didn't talk about mechanism of TMA in drug induced thrombotic microangiopathy, but it may be immune mediated or non immune mediated. So the treatment is to stop the drug and maybe plasma exchange, especially if it's immune mediated and there is evidence of photoantibodies against Adam T13 in the uh, circulation. <coughs> cancer associated, treat the cancer. <coughs> so now we didn't use plasma exchange except in drug induced TMA. Catastrophic antiphosphorylated syndrome, anticoagulation, immunosuppressive therapy, IV, IG, or plasma exchange. You may consider rituximab and uh, eclizumab. Scleroderma renal crisis, use as inhibitors, systemic lupus, immunosuppressive, and also plasma exchange in severe cases. Hypertensive emergency, control blood pressure, and copalamine deficiency, use copalamine. So we didn't <coughs> mention plasma exchange except in drug induced catastrophic uh, antiphospholipid syndrome and systemic lupus. What I didn't mention in my lecture, <clears throat> I didn't talk about transplant associated TMA, which are TMA related to hemopoietic stem cell transplant and kidney transplant. And again, I didn't talk about TMA in children. <clears throat> yes, I mentioned the hemolytic hemic syndrome, the typical form, but I mentioned it because it can also be presented in adults, but you have to uh, know that I didn't mention some form of that occur in children. For example, the neuraminidase uh, team A that is called by caused by streptococcus pneumonia. And by the way, in this case, the COMPS test is positive, not negative. And this is uh, a special situation. But generally, I didn't mention or talk about child uh, team A's. Today, I want to end my lecture by this slide. This is the first reported case about thrombotic microangiopathy. And you will find in the name of the case report, there is no a name of the disease TMA at that time. So the uh, author uh, put the title by description of the case. He called it an acute febrile pleochromic anemia with hyaline thrombosis of the terminal arteriole and the capillaries. He described, described the uh, pathogenesis and the pathology in the name of the uh, case report in 1925. It was a case report a long ago, but now it is a large topic that we are talking about. My lecture is about 45 minutes. So case reports always, because although they are of weak evidence, but always they may uh, be the seed to, of, uh, to a large topic that will be evolved later. Thank you for watching the lecture and see you again in uh, one uh, more lecture of NephroTube lectures.